Hello and <coughs> sorry. Hello and welcome back to everybody. This is now a short video on questions concerning the input tax deduction um, under value added tax law. And um, you remember, you heard that already in the video on tax exemptions that if the output which you produce is not liable to tax but tax free then you don't get any input tax deduction for the input which you made or which you bought in order to produce that output. So it is necessary if you decide about the treatment of input tax deduction or not deductible that you first think about what you do with uh, the input and um, that is the reason why in my personal testing scheme input tax questions are only asked at the end of a case because only at the end of the case you know what you did with the output or how the output was treated taxable or not taxable liable to tax or tax exempt another thing which you uh, naturally should keep in mind is if something is tax exempt that hinders you to deduct the input tax which corresponds um, to the raw material and services which you use for its production. If it's simply not taxable, it has not that effect. Uh, so only it, if a tax exemption is relevant or would come into play if something were taxable in the inland, only then input tax is not possible. In cases where you produce an output which is just not taxable because it happens, for example, uh, not in the inland, then nevertheless the input tax will remain deductible. So that underlines again how important the distinction is, the terminological distinction between taxable and liable to tax or tax free. And now when we um, deal a bit closer with uh, input tax deduction, we come to two sets of questions. The first thing is, in the first year where certain things happen, or at the end of a case, you can ask yourself, is there any input tax claim in play? And in order to have the full overview, you best ask yourselves, can the customer claim any input tax deduction for what the supplier delivered or rendered to the customer? And additionally, you can also um, look through the case if there is any information for input tax claims which the supplier could bring forward. For example, if somebody exports a machine from Germany to Russia, then um, the first thing is that would be tax exempt as an exportation. Um, so the VAT on the output would be zero and that's uh, relatively clear. If our Russian customer gets a delivery where the VAT is zero in the price, then the customer will have no possibility to reclaim any input tax. On the other hand, the supplier uh, either bought the machine from a producer or bought raw, machine, raw materials and produce the machine himself or herself. So we could then still bring a remark concerning the deductibility or non-deductibility of the input tax on the raw materials and the like. Then a second set of questions deals with um, if there are consequences in later years, because what I brought forward just now was only concerning the first year, so when input tax happened. But it might be that later the underlying assumptions which we use to decide about the input tax claim in the first year, that later these underlying assumptions prove to be wrong or that the situation changes and so certain adjustments have perhaps to be made. That would be, will be dealt with in paragraph 15a of the German Umsatzsteuergesetz. So that's corrections in later years. 
And that is uh, nothing else than our program for today in this video, because input tax deduction is exactly yeah, covered by these two sets of questions. So let's begin. In principle, value-added tax shall have no financial burden effect within the chain of entrepreneurs. So the idea is everything which um, is just a transaction between two entrepreneurs, which are both subject to VAT, shall have no effect. The uh, one entrepreneur pays the tax to the fiscal office, the next one claims it back. Uh, that is the reason why even for something like a long-term investment, like a machine or a building or anything else, the input tax is directly refunded. Um, so you don't have to depreciate things over time or so you directly get the money back. The idea is not even a liquidity effect, which can be avoided, should happen inside the enterprise sector. And that explains why the refund for input VAT does not have to wait until the output is produced, but that you can claim input tax VAT at the moment when you um, get the delivery or get the service from the entrepreneur where you buy it from. When you have the received that delivery or service and have an input, have an invoice, sorry, which can prove how much VAT was contained in that price. You can directly make your deduction claims. Now, um, the problem here is First, you have to check if all formal requirements of an invoice are made, are met. So you have to check if um, everything, every requirement is fulfilled. And you know, when we talked about invoicing details, there is perhaps even a long list. Um, even the most small mistake in the um, invoice which confirms the input tax, makes your input tax refund claim invalid. So you have to ask your um, supplier to correct the invoice and adjust it. Now let's assume that you have some um, supplier who works properly. So the invoice is completely okay, or it has been corrected and now it's okay. Then you have to pose yourself another question. The question is, am I going to use that input for the production of a tax free output, then I can't claim deduction? Or will I use that for taxable and, and or for an output which is not freed from tax, so which is liable to tax? Um, here you naturally have to make a prognosis. Now, um, either the outcome is you have the intention or you will use that input for the production of output, which is entirely liable to tax, then you can completely, so with 100%, deduct the input tax. Um, the other alternative or other extreme alternative is you use the input completely for the production of tax-free output, then you have a 0% refund claim. Now, naturally, you also have that combination in between that you use something partly for the production of an output which is liable to tax and partly for an output which is free from tax. In that case, you have to determine the part of the input tax which you can claim and the part which is not deductible. For this, then you read uh, you, you read rules. No, you need rules, ladies and gentlemen. So what is to be done in case where the deductibility is granted only uh, partially? 
you must find the method how to determine the deductible and the non-deductible part of the input tax. And um, the best thing is just have a look to European Union law, to the VAT directive. And the VAT directive gives you the choice between two methods. But um, if I say it gives you the choice, that's rather not perfect or simply untrue. It does not give you any choice. It gives your member state the choice to decide how it wants to deal with the matter. <laughs> Um, the first method, how you can attribute deductible, deductible and non-deductible parts, is the so-called pro rata method. That's a very easy, but on the other hand, very non-exact method. It's uh, probably the horror of any cost accountant, because it's the most primitive way to distribute cost. Uh, in the pro rata method, people just say, I imagine um, I have one output which is tax free and which is 10,000 euro, and I have another output which is 90,000 and liable to tax. Now I just uh, determine the relation between the two 90,000 liable to tax, 10,000 um, output is tax free. And so I just say, the input, the cost of the input, will be split up in a relation 90 to 10. Um, why is this the horror of any cost accounted? Because it has nothing to do with um, how much of the costs for the input have been caused by the two outputs. It might be that the output just caused the costs in a 50-50 relation. And now you just looked on the turnover and the relationship between the turnovers. And so if you look to what caused which costs, then your conclusion that it's 90 to 10 is completely wrong under an economic aspect. So to distribute costs according to the relation between the output turnovers is a very inadequate method. And indeed, every cost accountant lecture will first tell you that's not how it done. It can be done. That's not convincing. Nevertheless, this seems to be a very, very simple um, method. And so the articles 173 and the false following of the EU VAT directive say that's a uh, allowed method which the member states can choose. Now, alternatively, the VAT directive says the member states can also decide for um, methods which are more exact under the aspect of correct cost accounting. Um, that is in 173 subparagraph 2 of the VAT directive. And that is what Germany has done. Germany has strictly opted for the solution that the input tax has to attrib be attributed to the corresponding output according to the established principles of cost accounting. So according to how, sorry, which part of the cost had been caused by which part of the output so you have to find convincing keys how you can distribute the input cost to the output. And that is how it works here. And to understand the difference, again, an example. Imagine you have a building with four floors. All the floors have equal space. So it seems to be convincing that if you do something to the house, which is common cost for all the floors, that then each floor has a share of one fourth in the cost. Now imagine um, the turnover situation. The ground floor has been led by you to a merchant, and you can usually convince merchant to pay a high rent, 3,000 per month, plus VAT. 
The upper three floors are rented to private persons who live in uh, these floors and private persons, private living room, private rooms for living in them usually don't bring such a high rent. So here you only get 1000 for each floor. No? You paint the facade and that costs you 10,000 plus 1900 VAT. Now, under the pro rata method, you just compare the turnovers which you make with the two um, kinds of usage. The ground floor is let liable to tax. The other three floors are tax free. But um, now look to the taxable, tax liable, and tax free output. Tax liable 3000. Tax free three times 1000. So the relation between tax free and tax liable is 50 50. So under the pro rata method, you would be allowed to deduct 50% of the incoming VAT, 950. 50, the other 50% would be not deductible. If you look to um, the cost oriented methods, you would argue that each floor causes the same costs. That is something which everybody will agree to. So one fourth of all the floors is liable to tax. Three quarters of the building are free from tax. So only one quarter would be deductible under the cost accounting orientated methods which, for example, are to be followed in Germany. So you will, by the way, if you read court decisions by the European Court of Justice, you will very often um, stumble across decisions which um, argue about how the pro rata method has to be applied, which numbers from which period of time have to be uh, used as denominator or as the other part of a friction and so on. And you will, if you are from Germany, absolutely have no understanding for what they are doing there because for us this method does not count. Um, in our variant of the input tax legislation, which we chose, um, disputes will be more about the question, what is an adequate key to distribute costs to the individual outputs? Uh, so everybody has his or her own quarrels. Every member state um, has to decide which method it follows. Um, Germany explicitly said the pro rata method can only be applied if under the established principles of cost accounting, no convincing key for the distribution of the cost, whatever can be found at all. So that is in principle, no, in not in principle, but it, that is in the final effect, a kind of a nearly completely effective ban of the pro rata method for German um, cases. By the way, if you look in the German Tax Act for the um, paragraph which states that in case of mixed use of an input, you have to split up the input tax according to what you do with it, that can be found in paragraph 15, um, section 4. And the more basic rule that all input which is used for Tax-free output is banned from deduction, can be found in paragraph 15, uh, section 2, USDG. Now, let's uh, go on a bit to the problem of mixed usage of input. Your problem is when you buy something, a good or a service, you can only have ideas about what and plans about what you intend to do in the future. So. If you now have to um, decide about the input tax, which share of the input tax can be claimed and which is not deductible, then you can only estimate how the percentage 
will be. Um, in the retrospective, later, in the future, after things have been done, you will be cle more clever. You will know more. So your original prognosis might turn out later to be wrong. Perhaps your original plans turned out to be um, not working. You had to change them. Imagine you buy a building with input tax. You intend to let all floors to uh, business tenants. So you intend to rent them all out tax liable. But the problem is it doesn't work. You have to accept an insurance uh, broker. These people are tax free. You have to rent out the rooms to them also tax free. And a doctor moves in also tax free. So only 50% of the building are let in a liable way. And so from the retail perspective, you had only been entitled to 50% of the input tax. For this situation, for this problem, you need to find a solution. Um, and it must be a good one. You can't just say, well, as long as the original plans are honest, we allow everybody to deduct the input tax as it was planned. And if later things change as well, shit happens. Because then, especially in cases like with the building, um, the people would easily find out that you can obtain an enormous uh, amount of money from the fiscal administration if you just make an honest error in the prognosis, how you will use the building in the beginning and take great care that you can prove that your original estimate was honest and was no attempted tax fraud. I think every good tax advisor could invent a convincing story and so state would be rather defenseless if there were no mechanism how the original first time estimate could later be um, reviewed and corrected. So that is what we need. Um, the same um, problem also, by the way, arises in cases of the Prorata method, because if you um, buy something in the course of a year, which is intended for mixed usage, at the beginning of the year, you cannot know the, the ratio between tax-free and tax liable output of that year. So you have to work with provisory estimates during the year and later you will have to correct that. So you always have that prognosis problem. Huh? So what can we do about it? The correction of input tax in later years, what can we choose as basic approach? The only thing I can try to explain to you is naturally how the fundamental idea works. Let's have a look to an example first to understand what we could do. Um, and it's best to be explained with the building because there we can assume the building has four floors. You buy it at the beginning of a year, of year 01, for an amount of 400,000 plus 90% VAT. So the total amount of VAT for the whole building is 76,000. Now you know that on the 1st of January 01, if um, the building has been delivered, yes, it has. And if an invoice has been handed out, yes, it has. Let's assume that. We can immediately, and we shall immediately, we are even expected to do, immediately claiming input tax. Um, so we need to know what we are going to do with that building. Now it's a probably probable a reasonable assumption that we cannot let the rooms on the first day when we own the building, but at least we can know our plans. The ground floor uh, will be let to a shop owner and we will opt for tax liability that's possible if we have a shop owner as tenant the monthly rent paid will be 3000 plus vat 19 percent due to the option which we use 
the first floor, the second floor, and the third floor shall be occupied by private persons as tenants. So, as we can only opt for tax liability if our tenants are business tenants, there is no option possible. So, tax exemption stays valid. We can't get rid of it. Yeah. So, one quarter of the building will be used to generate tax liable output, and that entitles to input tax deduction, and three quarters don't. So, according to our plans, the owner of the building will have a right to one quarter of the input tax as deductible amount. One quarter is 76,000 by divided by four is 19,000. The rest, 57,000, is not deductible, and this follows from 415 for USDG. So, now, um, what does that mean economically if we deduct 19,000 or one quarter of the input tax? Um, you should know that under economic aspects, the price for a building is not immediately costs, but must be equally distributed over time. You know that from um, financial accounting, we claim depreciations. Yeah. So in reality, the cost of the building relate to its usage over time. Now, if there is value added tax included in the price, economic logic would also require to distribute this VAT expense equally over time. In order to attribute it proportionally to the periods where this consume or what else you call it is happening. Um, so if you want to say, or if you want to find out which input is used for production of which output you should also do something like a depreciation and you should distribute input tax over time so the first step which we should do is we just say we buy we build a house or buy a house for four hundred thousand and there is VAT on top of the house of 76,000. Now, um, let us just assume that we have a very progressive architect. And so we simplify our calculations by the assumption that the house will break down after 10 years. That makes dividing easy. Otherwise, our calculations would get a bit lengthy. Now, that means nothing else than 76,000 VAT refer to the next 10 years, the years during which the house exists. So each year carries a VAT amount of 7,600. Now, next step. When at the beginning we decided to claim one quarter of all the input tax as deductible, what we implicitly assumed was nothing else than that one quarter of the usage in each of these 10 years was liable or for purposes which are liable to output tax. So our assumption was that for all the next 10 years, one quarter of the usage of the house would be liable to tax and so that we would be entitled to one quarter of the VAT which refers to each of these years. So implicitly we assumed for each year we will have a claim of 1900. Now we can later now check for each individual year was this assumption in the retrospective correct or not. Well, now we can, after we have now the prognosticized usage per year and how much it will entitle us to input tax deduction, we can then compare with the real usage per year. Let's say year one, we really rented out one floor liable to tax. 
Then we prognosticize we have a right to one quarter of the VAT amount for this year, 1900. And retrospective shows our prognosis was right. We had a right to one quarter, so no deviation. Now imagine in year two, the private person on the first floor moves out, a lawyer moves in. By the way, that shows that we are rather, <sighs> that we are rather behaving in a risky way. Whoever would accept a lawyer as a tenant, the smallest dispute would end up in court. But imagine indeed we, we are in that state of madness, so we accept a lawyer as a tenant. And the lawyer sets up an office there. Okay, so now naturally we have a business tenant and that business tenant has only taxable and liable output. So that allows us to opt for tax liability. Our law you know, doesn't care if we charge him with, let's say, 2,000 euro net or 2,000 euro plus VAT because the lawyer doesn't care about an additional VAT amount because the lawyer would get input tax deduction for the additional VAT. So no damage done to the lawyer, but nice for us. Now we have two floors out of four, which we pay VAT for. So in the retrospective, we see that for this year, we would have been entitled for two quarters of the VAT amount, which relates to this year. Go back to the first column. It shows 7.6 relate to this year. 7.6 from all the VAT amount, which was uh, included in the purchase price under the aspect of cost accounting referred to this year. Now we have two quarters which we can claim. Now you see what did we claim in the original estimate only 1900. Oh, then we still can claim 1900 additionally because reviewing the original estimate in year two showed ah, we claimed too low an amount we still get something from the fiscal office. Now you can assume or you can probably guess what happens in year three. In year three, our private tenant occupying floor number three moves out again on the 1st of January because these people always leave our building because at moments when they simplify our calculation. Well, really nice tenants. A private detective takes over the rooms as his office. A certain Mr. Bogart or so. So on the on floor number three now we have Mr. Bogart, and as a private detective runs a business, is an entrepreneur, and is not free from tax. Who would ever exempt a private detective from tax, ladies and gentlemen? Clear. So we can opt for tax liability, we do. And so now we pay VAT on the rent for three of the four floors. So in the retrospective, we would have been entitled for this year even to a share of three quarters of the VAT referring or relating to that year. So seven, six relate to that year, we are entitled in the retrospective for a claim of 5.7, we only claimed at the, um, the beginning implicitly 1900 for this year. So 3.8 can still be claimed and will be claimed. Fiscal office pays to us 3.8. Hmm? Now in year four, one of our tenants wants to create problems. The fourth floor tenant, I hope there is a fourth, uh, so above, moves out and is replaced by a tax advisor as tenant. So the last private guy moves out, tax advisor comes in. You know, tax advisors are from the perspective of the fiscal authorities a pestilence and you, they would never free them from tax. So now we have also here now a business customer and we can opt for tax liability. 
But the problem is we only use the this upper floor for tax liable output for a half a year. What can we do now? Well, three quarters have been used liable to tax for the whole year. The last quarter has been used for liable output for a half a year. Now a half of a quarter is one eight. So that is seven eighths, and that means six thousand six hundred fifty would have been our right to tax if we had known that all in advance. Now we find it out in the retrospective and we compare again. For this year, we would have a claim of 6,650. We originally only claimed 1,900, so we still have a claim of 4,750. I hope you get now the principle. Um, let's say in year five, something strange happens. On the 1st of January, all our business tenants drop down dead and the whole building is then taken over by an insurance company. Now an insurance company produces tax-free output, output and under the German option rules we cannot opt for tax liability for the rent anymore. So the whole building is now used for tax-free output. Hmm. Okay. That's rather disappointing news. Um, nevertheless, the principle is the same as before. For year five, our cost calculation in the beginning, beginning said, out of the 76,000 euro, one tenth, namely 7,600, refers to that year. Originally, we estimated that we would have a claim of one fourth, namely 1900 for that year. We claimed that when we bought the building. Now, the retrospective shows us that was a shot into the oven, as we say in Germany. So it was a miscalculation, a complete error. Shameful. We have a right to zero. Now it's clear. The divergence is now in favor of the FISC. Oh. Now, originally we claimed 1900, sorry, was an error, was an honest error, so no tax fraud in play. But it was an error from the retrospective, we are frightfully sorry, here are the 1900 back. So here 1900 have to be paid back to the fiscal office for that year. And so you see, during the time during which you use that asset, every year you check if the original prognosis complies with what really happened. Uh, by the way, you do that only for the current year, because you see in this example, if for example in year 02, we would have corrected everything to two quarters for the rest of the remaining period, the next year would have brought a surprise, again a change. You would have to pay and pay back enormous sums of money. Nobody wants that, so the idea is at the moment when the acquisition of the asset is made, you make your estimate and do all the input tax deduction and data year after year, you only correct the um, original estimate, estimated usage for that particular year because you are not yet knowing in year four what year five will bring. So that is a reasonable approach. And that works in practice this way. So by such a mechanism, you can easily follow up the real usage of a good or service during the years of the useful life of an asset and can either make payback to the fiscal authorities, in this red case here, or in, you can claim the additional amount, which is in your favor and which you originally did not claim. In principle, you should do this for any long living asset. Um, but now imagine you buy a pen. Perhaps it's useful for three years 
Now it's naturally a waste of time and bureaucratic efforts. Um, far too expensive to follow up the usage of that pen during the next three years. So you will probably have to simplify things strongly. Huh? Now, probably every national legislator does their own simplifications. So what I tell you here is just the German approach. What Germany says in paragraph 15a is the estimated useful life for an asset is brutally simplified. For fixed assets, the estimate of useful life is narrowed down enormously. For a building, the useful life is indeed limited to 10 years at most. So whoever, um, <laughs> now you might suspect that whoever created that solution, the useful life for VAT purposes of a building is 10 years. That that person must have very frustrating experiences with an architect. But the um, realistic explanation is, it's a general principle in German tax law, that documents have only to be kept for 10 years approximately. And so the idea is, um, if one had extended that reviewing period over more than 10 years, then either the documents would have been lost. And it makes no sense to make in year 20 a correction of a VAT amount if the original VAT documents are no longer existent. Or one would have to extend the period for which all administrative documents of a firm had to be stored from 10 years to 20 years. And that would have strongly extended the storage rooms for archives. And so would have probably not something which people had liked. And so the decision was, let's limit it to 10 years. That is enough to avoid tax saving models for such things. And for movable assets, the maximum useful life was even limited for five years at most. So if you drive a car, under VAT correction um, rules, the useful life of that car is five years. Now, if the useful life is only half a year or three years because you are a well-known worldwide known drunkard and you always hit a car um, or always got involved in accidents and no car ever survived a useful life of more than three years, then useful life is shorter, then that counts. But the maximum for movable property is five years at most for VAT correction rules. Um, if you buy trading stock, so things which are only used once, namely for selling them, um, then the original purpose for which they were planned has to be co compared with the usage for which they definitively were used later, and uh, then a correction has to be made, irrespective of the time, because uh, trading stock has no use for life. You buy it, you wait for, for, for a customer, and then you sell it, or you use it for a tax-free purpose, and that would then spoil the original input tax deducting, deduction retroactively. The next point for simplification is uh, one does not bother to do this complicated process for low value assets. So if you buy a personal computer for 300 euro plus 57 euro of VAT and the whole thing is useful for three years, nobody expects you to follow up the correct estimate um, and compare it with the real usage because of these 19 euro VAT amount per year. So the uh, administration um, has a VAT regulation, so by the German government, which then sets thresholds. If an asset remains below that threshold, no correction takes place. That, by the way, is a reason why in exams these cases usually happen with buildings. 
because the building is indeed highly expensive and usually with the building you easily um, end up above all relevant thresholds so that you can ignore them during a case solution. And um, a further, a uh, further simplification is, in principle, you know that in German tax law, you have to hand in a preliminary tax declaration every month. Um, now that would mean that in case of such a building, you would have to follow up the correct usage of the building for every individual month. And so instead of comparing what I did, the VAT, which relates to every year, you should have done it for the VAT amount for every individual month. So not, um, not 10 lines in our table, but 120 lines. Uh, that could be a bit complicated if the VAT amounts in question are very, very small. And so correcting for every month is only necessary if really huge amounts are in play. Uh, so you have some simplifications, but if you understood the basic idea behind that 15A or the VAT correction me mechanism, then everything's nice. A last hint should be um, taken into account. Um, you know the term useful life. That uh, is what we really have in the back of our minds when we think about 15A. Now, the useful life estimate for VAT purposes has been so strongly restricted by these 10 or five years maximum periods that this very often can no longer be really called useful life. And in order, although it's the underlying idea, the underlying idea is the same as with the depreciation, but in order to remind you that you don't have to look to the real useful life, but to that maximum period of 10 or five years. So that for VAT purposes, you have to deviate from the correct useful life estimate and take a fictitious one. One uh, marks this in German literature, at least by using a different term. We call this the VAT adjustment period or Berichtigungszeitraum in German, in order to make clear to you that we don't look to the income tax useful life estimates, but to that rather brutally simplified um, adjustment period under VAT, where a house is used up after 10 years. Yeah. And if you have understood this, you can probably get along with practical cases too. Now I have, after this remark, a very probably, um, I don't know, probably a remark to make, which might make you happy a bit, because now we are through with our first overview about the VAT system and the most relevant rules. We have afterwards to train that with cases. And later we have to have a look on special situations and special rules where, um, let's say, one has to um, go a bit more into detail. So, yes, now you can rejoice a bit and make a bit of yoga or other things to um, clear your mind, relax, and so. And some cases will follow later. I thank you very much for watching. You can be proud that you survived until this part of the lecture. I hope. I hope you had some fun. Is that realistic? Probably not. But I thank you very much for watching. And I hope you come back soon when we come to cases. And then I say a preliminary goodbye till we see each other again. Thanks for watching. Till next time. Ciao.